Good morning. Well, in 2019, the BBC broadcasted a fascinating seven-part series on modern Northern Irish history entitled The Troubles, A Secret History. It was a very illuminating documentary. It featured previously unseen camera footage as well as modern-day interviews. Uh, there were cover-ups, the double agents, SAS ambushes, leaked documents and thoughtful commentary throughout. And the series ended on an intentionally solemn note. In the concluding episode, the presenter, Dara McIntyre, said that there could never be a single secret history because so much remains buried, hidden from public view. Instead of his view, the troubles have become a contest over versions of the past. If you watch the series, you'll understand why he came to that conclusion. Yet not is that yet is not that kind of thinking now the assumption regarding all history in our culture. The idea that there is no objective history out there, just subjective histories in the plural. No one overarching narrative of history, which is going somewhere that we fit into, only disputes over what has happened in the past. Well, Luke, the gospel writer, um, who wrote the part of the Bible we're looking at today, did not subscribe to that view of history. He wanted people to know capital T truth about the capital H history of Jesus Christ so they could know certainty and joy as they trusted in him. And here's what he writes in the introduction of the gospel to his friend Theophilus at the beginning of the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. Well, with those words in mind, let's pray. Father God, please strengthen our confidence in the truth of the facts about Jesus. Fill our hearts with joy and give us a passion to make Jesus known. In his name, amen. Well, I've got three very simple points to help walk us through the passage this morning. Uh, firstly, Jesus appears and the disciples see. That's verses 36 to 43. Jesus appears and the disciples see. Last week, we saw how Jesus met Cleopas and his friend as they were walking away uh, from Jerusalem towards Demaeus. Um, and then those two then returned to Jerusalem. They found the uh, 11 other disciples and a wider group of followers. And they're telling them, uh, as we join the story, that they've just seen Jesus. But then there's a mystery gate crasher. Verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they'd seen a spirit. As some of you might be aware, my wife Valentina and I and the children are preparing to move to serve the church family at St Oswald's uh, in Walkergate. And as part of moving, uh, preparing to move there, I had the joy of joining in with their Zoom church meetings on a Sunday. Um, and I've also had the joy of meeting some of them face to face. But I must admit, my initial reaction when I first met um, some of them in 3D was that I felt somewhat startled and frightened <laughs> actually here were people in 3d who i'd previously only known in 2d and i'm sure they've probably felt the same way too well something similar was happening in the minds of the disciples though they did know jesus well they had this in their minds that he was their friend a, a great leader the one they'd hoped would redeem israel but then he died on the cross and it seemed to be a failure, and to make that matters worse, his tomb was empty. That was Jesus in their mind. But then, verse 36, there's this Jesus, this man, is he a man who appears from nowhere? He's alive, he speaks to them, and they're startled, they're frightened. Is he a ghost? Who is he? And Jesus senses their terror, and he presents to them two pieces of evidence that, they, that the Jesus that they knew, um, they were with and live with, the one who died on the cross, is the same Jesus who is alive and standing in front of them and talking to them. The first evidence, piece of evidence is flesh, flesh. Uh, verse 38, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, 
that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. He's saying to them, it's really me. The pierced hands and feet that were previously nailed to the cross. Does that ring any bells? Come and see. So there's flesh, one piece of evidence. The second piece of evidence is fish. Fish. Verse 41. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marvelling, it sort of seems too good for, to be true to them, but they're excited. He said to them, have you anything to eat? Then they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now, when I first read this, I wasn't quite sure what broiled fish was. I thought it must be a culinary cousin of boiled fish, which doesn't sound very appetising. But broiled fish, um, from what I can make out, seems to be closer to barbecued fish. And that's very different. It brings back good memories of some barbecues uh, I've enjoyed in JPC Church family over the last 10 years. Most have been meaty affairs, but I remember one with tuna steaks and one with mackerel. Um, yeah, good memories, but enough of that. The point is that Jesus ate the fish. He wasn't a ghost. The food didn't kind of go through and the fish didn't go through his mouth and out the other side. It went into his stomach. He's a human, a human being who's risen from the dead. That's the point. What's the conclusion? Well, it's that this Jesus, who, who's with the disciples now, this Jesus risen from the dead with his glorious new resurrection body, is the same man as that Jesus who died publicly on the cross just a few days earlier. Where's the evidence? flesh and fish. But notice also the tone that Jesus has here as he speaks with his disciples. Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Notice on the one hand how gentle Jesus is. He doesn't condemn them for not believing who he is straight away. He invites them to consider the evidence before them. But notice also how bold Jesus is. He won't let his disciples get away with entertaining any doubts or any thoughts that he's just a ghost. He compels them to examine the evidence, to trust that he's really him, that he's human, that he's risen from the dead with his new resurrection body. And this Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. So if you're watching this and you struggle with the idea that Jesus rose again, Jesus doesn't write you off as an unbeliever and, and condemn you. He urges you to engage with the evidence about him and then move where the evidence takes you. Will you do that? Will you read one of the gospel accounts about him? And if you already trust in Jesus, as I do, you shouldn't be surprised if from time to time your mind starts to become clouded with doubts about who Jesus really is. Is he fully God and fully man, really? Did he really rise from the dead? And we've got to remember, friends, that we're in a spiritual battle. Satan wants us to doubt. People around us may encourage us to doubt. And the way forward is never to hide away from our doubts, but to own up to them and to bring them to these gospel accounts and to see the truth there about Jesus Christ. That's my first point. Jesus appears and the disciples see. Secondly, Jesus teaches <clears throat> and the disciples understand. Jesus teaches and the disciples understand. That's verses 44 to 49. Come back with me uh, to Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 34. That's just before Jesus reaches Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 31, and taking the 12, Jesus said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spat upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But, verse 34, they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, they did not grasp what was said. So here, Jesus taught that the Old Testament promises about him would be fulfilled when he reached Jerusalem, but the disciples did not understand what he was talking about. But it's different this time round. Different this time round. Look at verse 44 of chapter, um, of the last chapter. Verse 44, and he said to them, <clears throat> These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me 
in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Those are the words that I spoke to you when I was still with you. Do you remember Luke 18? That's the words. I'm repeating it now. But look what happens. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus is opening their minds to understand the scriptures. And the disciples get it. The pennies dropped because Jesus has opened their mind to understand what Jesus has been saying all along about his death and his resurrection. But there's more now that the disciples need to understand looking forwards. So verse 46, and he said to them, thus it's written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, which they've seen and has been accomplished. But then also verse 47, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. That is written in the scriptures. So here's the question, where in the Old Testament is it written that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name of Jesus Christ to all nations? Where do we get that from the Old Testament? Well, one example is in Isaiah 49, verse 6, where the Lord God says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? Sorry, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to do those things. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So through the Lord God is saying that through God's servant, God's salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. So who's this servant? Well, Luke, the gospel writer, leaves no wriggle room. He leaves us in no doubts. Back in Luke chapter 2, um, the old man Simeon holds the baby Jesus in his arms and says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles or nations it's the same word and for glory to your people israel so simeon is saying that god's servant the one promised in isaiah the one who will make salvation available to all people is jesus christ people from all nations now must turn back to jesus they must repent they must receive forgiveness for their sins from him <coughs> and in verse 48 when jesus says you are witnesses of these things he's referring to the apostles who were the eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection, we today testify to their true presentation of Jesus Christ. And the great news is that as we go about that today, as we go about sharing the authentic apostolic message of Jesus, we don't do so on our own, but we do so with the Spirit's help. <clears throat> Jesus said to the original disciples, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father on high, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. The apostles had to wait for the day of Pentecost, for the full outpouring of the Spirit to all believers. But if we're believing Jesus ourselves today, we already have the Spirit living in us. So we can go in Jesus' name to take the gospel to all nations. We can play our part in bringing God's sovereign plan, as talked about in the Old Testament, and through the new uh, onwards to fulfilment. And I think this should be a great encouragement for us as we seek to share the gospel with others. It's often hard work, it's often discouraging, it's tempting to give up and to think, well, to, to be honest, just to no longer dare to hope that any friend or family or, or colleague or neighbour might come to faith in Jesus. Well, we need to remember this. We need to remember that it is God's plan for the gospel to reach the ends of the earth. Worldwide evangelization, the advance of the gospel is God's plan. It's happening and his plan's on track and it will happen. In 47 BC, Julius Caesar allegedly said these famous words after concluding an impressive military victory in Turkey. Veni, vidi, vici. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. Well, the glorious risen Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, says to us this morning, in effect, I conquered, you saw, you go. I conquered, I have died for sin, I have broken the power of Satan, I have paid the penalty for sin once and for all, I have conquered death, I have risen again, I have conquered, I am seated at the right hand of the Father, I will return to judge the world, I have conquered, I have conquered, I have conquered, you saw, you have the authentic apostolic witness 
accounts in your hands, you have the eyewitness accounts, you have everything you need there in God's word. You saw, you go. Go and take the gospel to your communities, to your friends, to your family, and to all nations. World Mission 2, with the Spirit's help. I conquered, you saw, you go. That's my second point. Jesus teaches and the disciples understand. My final point is this. Jesus leaves and the disciples rejoice. That's verses 50 to 53. Jesus leaves and the disciples rejoice. Verse 50, then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. Why are the disciples here so happy that Jesus has left them? Well, it's because they've now understood from the scriptures how Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension fit into God's purposes. That's why they're really happy. Do you know that joy for yourself? Do you know the joy of seeing that history is not random, but has a purpose? Do you know the joy of understanding God's plan for the world as revealed in the Bible? Do you know the joy of seeing how Jesus Christ perfectly fits at the centre of that? And do you know the joy of seeing how you and I, with all of our sin and all of our weakness, can be part of God's great plan to spread the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth? Do you know the joy? Do you know the joy? If you don't yet know the joy, if you're not yet a Christian, it's not an exclusive club. Come in. Come in and join the joy. Come on with Jesus. Knowing Jesus Christ is the greatest joy. It's a joy that springs from the certain fact of history that Jesus really did rise from the dead. It's a joy that will always satisfy and will never run out. Why would you want to miss out? Well, let's finish by praying to the Lord Jesus now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died for our sins that you rose from the dead and are now seated at the right hand of your Father in heaven. Please equip us by your Spirit to be confident of the gospel message you've given us to share and to take that message boldly to the ends of the earth with your Spirit's help. In Jesus' name, Amen.